Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Welcome, everyone. We're going to be looking at the readings for this coming Sunday in the Latin lectionary. Please turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And I will be reading during this recording from the Latin lectionary as you find it in your parishes based on the New American Bible. The Lord said to Abram, go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the communities of the earth shall find blessing in you. Abram went as the Lord directed him. This is a very important text for us. It is one of the most commonly quoted texts from the Old Testament in the New. Think of the first verse of the New Testament. The book of the genealogy of Jesus the Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. That's a reference back to this story. Think of the ending of Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the text that we're looking at here is extremely important for our reading of the New Testament. And so Let's look at this in a little bit more context. Abraham is being called <clears throat> from Mesopotamia, from the land between the rivers, between the Tigris and Euphrates. And he's going to come up over the Fertile Crescent and come down into what will be known as the land of Canaan or the land of the Philistines, Palestine, or the land of Israel or the Promised Land, whatever you like. And when, when he arrives there, we find the beginning of these promises that God gives to Abraham starting to unfold. And so he says to him here, go from your land, from your kindred, from the place where you are, from your comfort zone, which is a place of paganism. He's living among pagans. And at that time, they were worshiping pagan gods. You can read more about this in chapter 24 of the book of Joshua. So you might want to take a look at that in your study this week, if you have time. Joshua chapter 24, where Joshua talks about Abraham before God called him. That back in Mesopotamia, Abraham and the ancestors were worshiping the pagan gods. But God called Abraham from that, from that world, to worship the one true God. And he was going to give him a special location, a piece of land, and all sorts of other special blessings. So that through Abram, through his descendants, as we'll find, all the nations could be blessed. All the nations could be blessed. This story in context of the book of Genesis follows chapters 10 and 11, where we hear about all of the generations, all of the nations, all of the various tribes and types of people that are coming from the family of Noah. Remember, Noah has the three sons. They come out of the ark. And then from those three sons, we hear about all of the earth being inhabited. And we hear about the Philistines and the Canaanites, and the, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all of those nations that were listed in chapters 10 and 11 is the focus of this passage right here. Abram was called from them for their sake. So that through Abram and through his descendants, all the nations eventually could be blessed. God's not a Calvinist. So he called Abram for the sake of those from whom he was called. This is an important lesson for us as we continue to study uh, the, the rest of the readings today. Now, why are we looking at this text right now? Why is this in the lectionary? Well, this is a very old relic of the lectionary cycle from the early church. In the early church, 
the catechumens would hear readings from Genesis and Exodus, and then also Proverbs and Isaiah and Job, in preparation for their coming baptism, confirmation, and reception of Holy Eucharist on Pascha, or Easter, if you so choose to call it that. So the readings we're looking at right now are part of a process of preparation for a catechumen who is being called from the nations, right, from the world, to remain in the world, but to be no longer of the world, as Jesus prays in John chapter 17. So we have to rewind back to the origins of this Lenten season, of which we've spoken a number of times already. But remember that the Lenten season is a time of preparation, first and foremost for the catechumen, and it still is. But very early on, the sponsors of the catechumens, and then the rest of the parish into which the catechumens would be baptized, started fasting and, and preparing along with the catechumens, shouldering the burden with them. And this created organically the Lent that we know of today, where we all, as baptized Christians, go through a process during these 40 days of a kind of a renewal of a, or a appreciation of what God has done for us in our holy baptism. All right, so that's the historical context of why we have this in the lectionary at this point and why it's also, therefore, important for us. Right? We all are going to go through this process, but focusing in on the, on the, the pattern here, we see that Abram was called from the nations to a special place. Through, and then he was going to be given special blessings. But notice, not in and of, those blessings are not simply ends in themselves. Abram's call is not an end in itself. That's just not what it's all about. It's rather the blessings that Abram will be given, the land, uh, the, the, uh, the great nation, the descendants, and all the blessings that he's going to give him are all so that through Abram, God could then bless and give all of this to all the nations. So the same thing happens with Israel. This is the story of Israel as well. The Israelites will leave Egypt. Right? After, after a while, the end of the book of Genesis, we find that all the work God had done with Abram and, and, and his descendants has been undone. They end up back in a pagan nation. Yeah? Just like Abram in Mesopotamia. Abram's descendants, Abraham's descendants, the people of Israel, the 12 tribes, are now in Egypt, a pagan land, and they're there for 400 years. They're eating like Egyptians, walking like Egyptians, talking like Egyptians, and worshiping like Egyptians. And so now we've got a problem again. God has to renew the call of Abraham in a certain sense, renew that purpose of the descents of Abram. So the story of Abram is in the book of Genesis where Moses is the primary author of this text of Genesis, and Moses is the one at the time of the Exodus this is, that God is using to, to bring about this great blessing and renewal of that call through the descents of Abram. So, so Moses tells the story of Abram catechetically in a way that will help the Israelites in the Exodus understand what's going on in their life. So the Israelites are brought to Mount Sinai and given the special information, the, the law, and, and given an opportunity to renew that covenant with Abram and re-yoke themselves to the one true God, so that through them, God could use them to be a blessing to all the nations. We hear about this when they arrive at Sinai in chapter 19 of Exodus. God says, you are a holy nation, a holy nation set apart. A holy nation, kadosh in Hebrew means set apart, distinct, different. But God sets things apart from other things for a purpose, not just for the sake of setting them apart, right? He, he sanctifies the Sabbath in the Old Testament for them as an opportunity for them to rest so that they can then meditate upon 
the creator who gave them all of the blessings they have, right? So it's not just simply setting something apart for the sake of it being set apart. No, but it's being set apart for a purpose, right? And so the same thing happens in the story of the Israelites, as with Abram. The Israelites are brought to Mount Sinai, and God says to them, you are a holy nation that is set apart from all the rest of the nations. You shall be to me a priestly people. That's the purpose then. So they're set apart from the nations for what purpose? They're called from the paganism of Egypt, just like Abram was called from all that world and from the nations, so that God could give them that land he promised to Abram, so that they could be, in a certain sense, the beaches of Normandy, right? the beginning of the restoration of all the nations, the great war for God's, God's family is, is going to begin. God is going to fight to get his children back. And his children are not just, not just Israel, but all those nations. He wants them all back. All the descendants of Adam. He wants them all back. And so, so he's, he calls Israel to this calling again, this, this call of Abram. Israel receives and is renewed. They come to Mount Sinai, and they're to be not only different from the nations, but a priestly nation. What's a priestly nation? Priestly means that they are going to be a priest has two roles. It's they're, they are the mediatorial individual in a relationship between two others. So we have God, and then you have the people, and then you have the priests. And this is in any culture. This is in any religion. You've got some sort of a mediatorial role like this. This is what God uses that language. There. He says, you, O Israel, will be like a priest among the nations. So they're called to this special job, but they they, they obviously now have a job to do. What is that? Well, the priest's job is to pray to God for those that are not the priests, pray for the rest, right? And then speak to those that are not the priest in the name of the God. So they're the, the point of communication. So Israel was called from the nations. They were made up to be a priestly nation. That was their job. That is to go to be the go-between between God and the nations that were not yet in a covenantal relationship. So that they could pray to God that those nations would someday come into the, a relationship with God like they have. And that God would bestow upon them his blessings and they would speak to the nations then about God's blessings and his plans for them. They would preach to the nations about the one true God. That was their calling. They never really did it, of course, you know. And they, as St. Stephen says, just before the Jews killed him in Acts 7, you received the laws delivered by angels, but did not keep it. Right? As soon as Moses goes back up the mountain, then they build the golden calf and start worshiping a god of, of Egypt. And then, that, of course, in many ways, just a summary of, of what's going to happen to the history of the people of Israel. God called Israel and brought them forth, as he says, out of, out of Egypt on eagles' wings, right, with great speed. But it's going to take the rest of the Old Testament to take Egypt out of Israel. Okay, so that's important for us. This is important for us because we're looking at this text not only for Abram, for the, and remembering the story of Abram, remembering the story of, of Israel, but remembering that this is for the catechumen. And in the end, it's really for all of us, right? We, can, we are called like the catechumen, like Abram, like Israel, to, from this world. We remain in the world, but no longer of the world, right? So, that we, so we're set apart. We're, we're set apart just like the catechumen is. We already have been set apart. We were baptized. And we have a special calling that we need to remember during this Lent, just like the catechumen is learning, that we are being set apart from the rest of humanity, not because God's a Calvinist. No, he, we're, we're being set apart. The catechumen has been set apart. We've been set apart. So we now have a priestly role. Right? The church is Israel. I don't know if there's any Zionists listening, but I'm sorry to wake you up. But, but if you go read Galatians, letter of the Philippians, uh, Romans, Paul shows very clearly that those who are baptized in Christ are Israel. 
the true Israel. And those who have rejected Christ are like branches cut off from the tree of, of the people of God. Okay, so, so he says that, and that's very important for us because we are then the fulfillment of the story of Abram. We're the fulfillment of the story of Israel. Through Jesus Christ, we are members of his body. We are now members of the kingdom of God. We are Israel. And therefore, we have this calling. The church has this calling to be in this world, but not of this world. This is why the music in the church is never to imitate the music of the world, as if somehow that's going to attract the world into the church. No, no, that's the opposite effect, right? No, no one's going to walk into a church and listen to poorly done rock music and say, oh, I'd like to hang out here. No, they'd rather just go out to a rock concert. It's going to be much, much better. You know, they're going to do a much better job out there in the world of doing worldly music. Our music in the church should be otherworldly. It should be in this world, but not of this world. Our worship should not look like the world, but be distinct. Our worship should be the apostolic worship that's handed on to us over for 2,000 years. And then when someone walks into our church and they see how we worship, they hear how we pray, ancient prayers for 2,000 years, ancient hymns that have been sung for 2,000 years, then they say, this is in the world, but not of the world. I'd like to learn more about, a little more about this. I, I might want to become a catechumen. So we have a job as the church to be distinct from the world, holy, set apart. The whole church must be this, a set apart nation like Israel was called out of Egypt, but not just set apart, but to be priestly, to pray for the nations, pray for the nations, and then each individual one of us to pray for, pray for those around us. Right? We each have this individual priestly calling to pray for those around us, that they come into communion with one true God. And then here's the hard part that no one ever wants to do. You may be at work or in the neighborhood or in your family and say, oh, I need, I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to pray for that person. Right? You have that priestly role. And that's good. But here's the part that no one ever wants to do. This is the one that takes courage. And with it often comes persecution. Is to speak to the nations or that is to speak to those around us in the name of God. To speak to someone and tell them, hey, you can't do that. That is sin. You can't do that. That is sin. This is not good for you. This is not in accord with law, God's law. This is what Israel was to do. Hey, stop worshiping those pagan gods, O Philistine. Stop worshiping those pagan gods, O Greeks. And come to learn, the one, learn who is the one true God, your father and creator. You can see Paul doing this in Acts when he goes to preach among the Gentiles. That's our job. In our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our families, and that's the, that job takes some courage because with it often comes persecution. And that's the job that I would have to say that Christians today have forgotten. The church today has fallen flat on its face. The church today has failed miserably. And I, I'm saying this as clergy. I'm talking about not just the lady, the bishops, the priests, every level failed to preach the truth of Jesus Christ. And that is a lack of charity. True charity is to tell somebody what's wrong, like a doctor telling somebody what they're sick and what they, how they need to heal themselves. But a doctor who has a patient who comes to him and asks and stands before him and the doctor can see, hey, this is what's wrong, this is what's wrong. But the doctor doesn't want to say what's wrong and doesn't tell them what the medicine is. That is not a doctor that's doing his job. We need to think about that this Lent. Okay, so the responsorial psalm is Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Lord, let your mercy be on us as we place our trust in you. Lord, let your mercy be on us as we place our trust in you. So why is that psalm given today? Well, that's what, the, what Abraham is being asked to trust. To trust. Okay, and I, I like that word there. I'm, I'm glad that we have trust there in the translation. Some of the translations here in the New American are all that great, but like for example, uh, so that all the communities might be blessed. It's not really what it says. It's that all the nations or tribes, the ones we were just talking, we didn't hear about the Philistine community and the uh, and the the 
the community of the Canaanites in the previous chapters of Genesis. No, no, we heard about tribes, nations, ethnicities, all the different peoples. Israel is one nation, one ethnicity, but they're called to be a blessing to all the ethnicities, all the nations. The use of communities there in, in the translation in the New American makes me a little suspicious of the way the word community gets used today uh, in the modern political agendas, sometimes tragically even infecting the church, but that's for another commentary. All right, so now look what it says, trust in Psalm 33. Trust, we place our trust in you. So this is what Abraham was called to, to put his faith, his trust in God. Israel is being called to put their trust in God. What is trust? Trust is faith. This is the word faith. Uh, you may have heard me say this before. I, I think it's a word we, we should probably jettison in our modern uh, ecclesial language. It means nothing anymore. It's so confused because of all of the different heretical groups today that use the word faith in so many different ways, incorrectly, erroneously. What we what we might be better off is just using the word, the English word trust, the word trust, because that's really what the Greek word means here, to trust, to trust. And this is what faith means, to have faith in. But again, it, most people, it, it's confusing for people because the word is used so many different ways. So to have our trust, Abraham was asked to put his trust. I'd like you for your homework, okay, this week, before you go to church this Sunday, go read Hebrews chapter 11 one of my most favorite chapters in the New Testament. It's a whole chapter about trust or faith. It says there that Abram was called by God and he trusted the one who called him. And he went out not knowing where he was going to go. He had no GPS. It's a whole chapter about trust. Noah trusted and built an ark. It hadn't even started raining yet. So there's this theme of trust or faith, if, if we use that word, Trust, Abram is being asked to come from a place to a place, to a new life. And there's an unknown there. That unknown can only be seen with eyes of faith, eyes of trust. Well, how do we have trust? You've heard me say it before. Our trust, that is our faith, must be based on reason. If we don't know what God has done in the past, there's no way you can have any expectation of what he's going to do now or in the future. This is why salvation history is so important. We can know what God has done. And since God is immutable, does not change, he's always doing the same thing. Then we can know with faith, with trust, what he will do now in my life and in the future. And so Abraham, Israel, the catechumen, modern Christian, we are asked to trust God. We're entering into a journey. We're leaving the place where we were and we're headed to the promised land. And there's some unknowns there. What will life be like in after 40 days? What will life be like? A little different maybe, but let's head out on that journey, trusting in him, knowing what he has done. We can have trust in him now. Huh? So let's now look at the gospel reading. The gospel reading is Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. So let's turn there, your Bibles, Matthew chapter 17. 17. This is the transfiguration story. It's recorded in all three synoptic gospels. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Right? He leaves the other disciples down at the bottom of the mountain. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well. Please listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and do not be afraid. 
And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Okay, so context, first of all. As I mentioned, all three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell this story. We also hear it in the Petrine epistles, a reference to it. So the, uh, the story is, is, of course, the transfiguration. We all know, we, we're all familiar with the story. But I think often we hear these stories about the life of Jesus, like something like this, and it's, it's kind of random. It's like, well, okay, one day they went up a mountain and this, they turned into a bright light, and then, uh, then they went down the mountain. Well, it, it did happen one day, but we have to understand the story of the life of Jesus and where this happened to, to really appreciate what's happening. Jesus began his earthly ministry after his baptism. The Synoptic Gospels tell us the baptism and his earthly ministry and how the Spirit descended upon him after he came out of the water. The Spirit descended, and a voice from heaven said, Behold my son. Now, you don't want to think of some adoption, uh, adoptionism, like an Arian heresy, that somehow this is the moment when Jesus suddenly becomes the Son of God and suddenly has the Spirit. He you know, goes from being a, a human being to now a, a demigod or something. No. Jesus is the word of God in the flesh. Jesus is God incarnate from the moment of the conception. And we even find in Matthew and Luke in the infancy narratives that that conception takes place by the power of the spirit and that, that the spirit is now, now there in the womb of Mary with the son, right? So there's uh, the theme of the spirit, especially in Luke's gospel, you can see that where Mary goes and then the Zechariah, Elizabeth, the spirit is, is spilling out all over the place. Okay, so now, the, uh, so what's happening here is a revelation of who Jesus is, a revelation of who Jesus is. He, he has been revealed, this, this man of Nazareth, this son of David, this Jew of the, of the family of David, has been revealed as the long-awaited Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king. Remember, the Jews were waiting for the return of the Christ. A lot of people think that they were waiting for the Christ to appear, the Messiah, and that's true as long as you understand that is a reappearance, okay? So the, the Christ, the anointed one, Greek, or the Hebrew, Hamashiach, the Messiah, is a title for the king in the Old Testament. You know this, the, the, the ICC crowd knows this. We've talked about this many times before, that remember there was one God, Israel had one, one God and one king. The first king of Israel was God. This is absolutely critical to grasp. And they get to a point in their history where they ask for a human king as well. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 8. You can go read about this if you've, this is new information for you. Then we hear about the anointing of, of Saul. Saul is the first one to be called the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. In fact, you can see the title being used for him there in chapter 12 of that same book, 1 Samuel. Well, you know, after three strikes, it doesn't work out. The, the, so God calls David. Samuel goes and anoints David. Christ's Messiah is anoints David in chapter 16 of that book. And now David's the Christ, the anointed one, the king. Okay, so that is the story of the kings of the Old Testament, the beginning of it, the beginning of the kings, the Christs. There are two kings. There's the divine king and then now a human king who has a title of the Christ. He will also have the title Son of God because the dynasty of David is given a special promise. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, so a whole book later. God promises to David that his dynasty, his descendants, will be the only ones that have the right to sit on the throne in Jerusalem to represent him, his kingship. And so, so now we have this promise. So, so the line of David is the only one that has that, that right to rule. And then we find the kings in Jerusalem all the way to the Babylon exile are all the line of David, then they are cut off in a certain sense and disappear. Well, for the next 500 years, while well, Israel is waiting for the restoration and prophesied after the Babylon exile, they're anticipating the return of two kings, the human king of the line of David, the son of God, and then also the divine king. The divine king and the human king disappeared at the same time when the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem. The glory cloud left the temple, 
and Zedekiah was taken off in chains. So they're waiting for the return of these two kings, the, the divine king to his palace, his temple. The temple is empty in Jerusalem in the first century. There's no glory cloud there. And they're waiting for the return of the Messiah, the anointed king of the line of David, who's the king is not only called the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. He's also called son of God because God promised that the line of David would be taken care of as God's own sons. He says, your sons, David, this second same son, shall be my sons. All right, so that's, that's the language seen here at the baptism. Jesus being revealed as the anointed one. The spirit is descending. She's being shown in the voice, this is my son. This, all this language points to this, but also is language that's, that reminds us of, and the way it's spoken here, of Isaiah 42, verses 1 and following, the beginning of the suffering servant psalms. We've talked about this in other lessons. So it reminds us of what's coming. The baptism story is foreshadowing something that's to come. Not only is Jesus being revealed as this, this, this Christ, but we already have a hint there in that baptism story that he's also going to be suffering. Now, that first half of the gospel ends with Caesarea Philippi, when the disciples now say, after three years of being with Jesus in their oral exam, who am I? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Christ, you know, to one Son of the living God. It's an, they enunciate what happened to the baptism. They now have, have accepted what was revealed. They've seen what he's done. They've heard what he's done for three years. And now they say, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, the, the Son of God. And so that's the first half of the Synoptic Gospel. The revelation that Jesus of Nazareth is the return of the Messiah. He's the long-awaited Christ, the King of Jerusalem, of the house of David, and therefore son of God. The second half of a synoptic gospel mirrors that first half. And that's why this transfiguration story looks like the baptism story. There's so many parallels. Because this is the beginning of part two, the sequel. Now they're going to learn something that Jesus of Nazareth, the long-awaited Messiah that they've been waiting, this Messiah to return, this earthly king, is actually the divine king as well. He's the return of both kings. And so that's why we get the glory cloud image here. Here now at the Transfiguration, we come into book two, part two of the Synoptic story, which is going to end not at Caesarea Philippi, but at the empty tomb at the resurrection. And so what we have here in the Transfiguration is a revelation to these very special apostles, Peter, James, and John, that Jesus is not just the Messiah, not just the earthly king, son of David, son of God, but he's actually the divine king dwelling among them. And so this is why Peter says, uh, I'd like to make some tents. He's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was the great feast of the Jews in the Old Testament. Pentecost, of course, was one of them. Passover was one of them, and tabernacles, right? So we know these feasts, Passover, Pentecost, tabernacles. One leads to the other. Passover, they come out of Egypt, so they can come to Mount Sinai. That's Pentecost, they receive the law. But they receive the law so they can say, all that the Lord has said we will do, and now they've got a, a covenant, and now God will come to dwell among them. And the Feast of Tabernacles for the Israelites, in the end, by the time you get to the post exilic period, that's their understanding of the Feast of Tabernacles, that it was... A feast in which God dwelt among his people, and they remembered that. What a great gift. It was a, return, a, res, a restoration of Eden. Well, there's a problem in the first century. The glory cloud hasn't yet returned. But the, the prophets all spoke of this coming, and this is part of the revelation of Peter and James and John here. One of the late, last great prophets of the Old Testament, the Pogzilic period, has a little commentary on this. In Zechariah chapter 14, the last chapter of his book, this post-exilic prophet talks about the restoration of the kingdom. And he describes it like the Feast of Tabernacles. When all the nations shall gather to Jerusalem, to the people of God, and come to worship the king of Israel. Singular, the king, not two kings, one king. Who is God? 
Okay, so Zechariah chapter 14 is a very interesting passage in that it talks about the return, the, the restoration of the kingdom for Israel. But again, it shows that they will then finally do what they were called to do. They will finally do what Abraham was called to do. That is, be the conduit through which all the nations will come into the people of God to worship the one true God, right? To come into communion with him and to worship him at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what it says. When God, the divine king, will dwell on earth again among the people. Restoration of Edom. Finally, all of the descendants of Adam have been gathered back into the garden, back in the kingdom of God, in the new Jerusalem, worshiping and loving their father, and he is caring for his children. And it's described like the Feast of Tabernacles. Very, very beautiful passage. You can read that maybe for your extra study as you prepare to celebrate the liturgy this Sunday. Okay, so that is, that's what's going on in Peter's mind. He's realizing this is, that he's realizing all of these things are happening in, in, before his eyes. And then, uh, then we also hear them coming down the mountain, and Jesus says, tell no one what you've seen until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And so that shows us this is a framing device. This is the first, this is the bookend uh, that is going to frame for us this second half of the gospel with the other bookend, that is the resurrection, the empty tomb. The light of the transfiguration is a foreshadowing of the light of the resurrection. And Matthew shows us that right here. We need this information. The apostles are going to need this information to be able to endure what's coming next. They're going to see their, their rabbi, their teacher, who formerly commanded the winds and the sea, who walked on water, who had an answer every time he was asked a question and would silence his opponents. This mighty teacher of whom they ask, who is this man? And who they now know is the Messiah. Is going to very shortly when they arrive in Jerusalem, be silent before his accusers, be bound. And then eventually they'll see him hanging on the cross, dead. In order to be able to endure that of what's coming, this passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In order to be able to, to stick around for the resurrection, they're going to need the transfiguration. And so Jesus reveals to his disciples now his divine glory, so that when they see him crucified, they will know that he is suffering willingly, that he's in power still, but he's doing this willingly. And so that's the, the uh, context of the uh, of the story in the, in the gospel. But why are we reading this right now? Well, this is what's happening for the catechumen. The catechumen, and we who are beginning this journey, this 40-day journey, are heading to Jerusalem. We're going to head with Jesus to Jerusalem. We're going to see him no longer having answers, but being silent. We're going to seek him, no longer commanding the wind and sea, but suddenly bound in chains with ropes. And then we're going to see him hanging on the cross dead. And we're going to be able to endure all of that because we know the empty tomb is coming. And so the catechumen is given at this moment. And we also are reminded of who Jesus really is in all of his divine glory. So as we go through Lent, as we go through these 40 days, we will have in our hearts what Father Alexander Schmemann, of blessed memory, once said, that during Great Lent, we have in our hearts a joyful sorrow. So we are sorry for our sin. We are, we are, we are going through a transformation that is sometimes a little painful and we can feel it in the fasting and the extra church services and prayer and almsgiving. We're, we're, when we transform in this way, it, it can hurt a little bit. We're going to be losing a little more self-love, going through a little maybe purification with some fire. 
And that purification, that burning, that, that purification, that cleansing process, well, we will feel lost. We will, we will find ourselves growing in a very special way. And so we have a, a joyful sorrow. Right? always with the sorrow of our sin, with the sorrow and the, and the, and the that feeling of loss, that, that change that we're going for, that purification, we have a joy, a light in our hearts. We know what's coming. We know that Jesus will rise from the dead at the end of the story. And then, therefore, it's important for us to remember now that Jesus is risen from the dead. It's not that he will rise. He is risen from the dead. He already is risen for the catechumen. He already is risen. In the story of the gospel, he's not yet risen. But we are 2,000 years later experiencing the fruit of that gospel, the fruit of the good news, the fruit of the empty tomb. We have become participants in the resurrected Lord through our baptism, confirmation, and reception of the Holy Eucharist. We are a member of his risen body. And so we can have joy as we're going through Lent, that joyful sorrow. As we behold, as again, as Shreman, Father Shreman says, we can behold the resurrection like the light on the horizon. I, every morning when I wake up here in my house, we have, I have a window that faces east. And I see when I get up, I can see the sky starting to lighten over the mountains. And then, then all of a sudden, I see a flash of light that fills the room with light. And then all of a sudden the whole sky lights up and, the, and now we have the day, right? So, so we, we can behold, Father Shreeman says, the coming resurrection, like a light on the horizon. We see the sun just beginning to give us a little light over the horizon. We can see the sky starting to go from black to gray and then brighter and brighter. As we head towards the resurrection of Jesus, it should be like the sun beginning to rise. It's getting brighter and brighter. Hmm? Okay, uh, now we have one more reading, uh, and that is 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'll read here again from the lectionary version. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Beloved, Bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. So listen to that language. You can see why this is chosen uh, in the lectionary. Bear, you, bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. What hardship in the gospel? Hmm? I'll finish reading here, but think about this. What, what hardship is there in the gospel? Well, there's something important for us that comes from God. We have a strength that comes from God. Bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the share that comes from God. He saved us, past tense, he saved us and called us for a holy life. Listen to that language. He saved us and called us for a holy life. Not according to our works, but according to his own design. Not according to what we've done, what he has done. And we'll talk more about the use of works there in a second. And the grace bestowed on us, grace in Greek is the word gift. And the grace bestowed on us in Christ. Look at the preposition, in Christ. Before time began. So that what happened at the cross is an eternal gift from God. God is outside of time. This is his great plan. But now, made manifest through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus. The grace bestowed on us in Christ Jesus, bestowed before time began, but now made manifest, now revealed, through the appearance of our Savior, that is the one who saves us from our enemies. This is, this is military language, Savior from the Old Testament. Savior, Christ Jesus, the anointed, the anointed one, right? The king. What did he do for us? who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I want you to look at that line again. Read this. Who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel 
that he was talking about in the beginning. This is a very beautiful passage in, in 1 Timothy. It's a nice framing device there as well. Okay, so context, first of all, what are we talking about? This is Paul. Whenever we're looking at a, an ancient text, and actually we're looking at a, a modern text, or we're listening to a, a speech or anything, who's the author? Who's the intended audience? That's the part we often miss. And what's the purpose of writing? Well, who is Paul? Paul is an apostle. We know enough about him. I don't have to go into the details about his conversion, his, uh, his travels, his epistles he's written. But this is Paul at the end of his life. This is his second letter to Timothy, possibly his last letter he will write, if not very close to it. He writes this letter to Timothy. You can hear in chapter four of the epistle that he's, he, I'm, I'm, he knows he's about ready to die. And he encourages Timothy in this letter with some incredible pastoral advice to be strong in his exhortation of the people in Ephesus. He encourages Timothy. Timothy's a young man. And he, Paul knows that Timothy has sometimes been a little meek a little uh, maybe timid in his preaching of the gospel. You can hear this throughout the two epistles Paul writes to him. He says to him in chapter, uh, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, preach the word, Timothy. Let's preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be, uh, be strong, he tells him. It would be good to read maybe this week, to go read uh, maybe the whole epistle, maybe First and Second Timothy. But if you have limited time, at least chapter 4 of Second Timothy. Paul is encouraging Timothy to be strong and bearing up the hardship of the gospel. What's that hardship of the gospel? Well, it's the same hardship that Abraham endured. It's the same hardship that Israel endured. It's the same hardship that the catechumen in, in, is asking to endure. It's the hardship that we find Jesus Christ enduring in his passion, death, and resurrection. And it's the same hardship that we are asked to endure. And what is that hardship? Well, we talked about this being called from the nations, from our world, so that we can be a priestly nation or a priestly people, or a priest in my, in my neighborhood, a priest in my family, a priest in my workplace. What does that mean? To, to pray for those who are in need. Pray for your boss. Pray for your employee, employee fellow, or your employee, or your fellow uh, uh, employee, the, the one next to you in the, in the workplace, for your neighbor, for your brother, your sister, whoever it is. Pray for those that need your prayer that their life will be changed and that they will come into communion with God in the way that you are. But that's not where the job ends. That's not where the job ends. Look at what he says here. He says, he says, bear your share of hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. Hardship of the gospel, praying for those around you, it's not that hard. Okay, it might take a little time, but it's not that hard. What kind of strength are you going to need there? The language here is talking about what, what Paul was saying to Timothy in that exhortation. That we, our job, and it's not just Timothy's job, but our job also is to preach the gospel. To preach the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel, which, as I said, Christians today just don't want to do anymore. Even the clergy. Very rare you hear the gospel preached from pulpit anymore. Very rare you hear a bishop preach the truth of the gospel. The church has fallen flat on its face in the modern culture. It has now become like the nations. The priests, the bishops, even the laity. Now talk and walk like the nations, like Israel had become in Egypt. 
We fail to do our job. We are to bear the hardship for the gospel with the strength that comes from God. How, what is that hardship? That hardship is that when you're in the workplace or in the neighborhood or in your family and you see somebody who is in need of hearing the gospel, the light that needs to shine in the darkness of their world and their life, you better tell them the truth. Otherwise, you're like a doctor not doing your job. We have to do our job. Is it when a patient walks into the room and, you as a, and the doctor sees this guy's got this, this, and this wrong with him, and he's going to need this kind of medicine, this kind of medicine to heal him, and the doctor says to him, you're okay. I know you're not feeling well, but that's all in your head. Just go. You don't need any medicine. Continue living your life. And ignore all these funny feelings you're having because you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. Well, that's a, that's a lie. That's a horrible lie. And we are doing an incredible disservice as a doctor for that patient. We are doing an incredible disservice for the nations, for those around us. When we have been called from them for their sake to be the priest. Our family, our workplace, our neighborhood. When we find, we realize that we're different from those around us, that we are, we're trying to live the Christian life. We're baptized and you're surrounded by a Hindu and a homosexual and a, and a, a Muslim and a atheist agnostic or whatever, you know, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, you've got to be a light in the darkness. You've got to shine the light of the gospel into their lives. And when you're afraid to do that, when you're afraid to do that, realize you're not shouldering not bearing your share of the hardship of the gospel. But don't be afraid. Your strength comes from God. And once you put that, it's just like you see something kind of heavy, you think, I don't know if I can pick that up. I don't know if I can pick that up. And then you pick it up. Well, I did it. Well, it's kind of heavy, but I've got it. Okay? So you're not going to know that you can carry that burden. That you can actually preach the gospel until you start doing it. And once you do it, you'll realize your strength to do it Something you thought you couldn't do actually comes from God. You find an, an inner strength. It's not going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be picking up a heavy weight. You're going to be picking up that cross with Jesus and carrying it while people are spitting on you and, and mocking you and saying that you're unkind, saying that you're uncharitable, when actually you're, you're the one being kind. You're the one being charitable. Preach the word, Timothy. Preach the truth of the gospel. He saved us and called us to a holy life, the epistle says. Holy life, set apart, distinct. Not to be like the nations. If you find that your life doesn't look too different from the life of your pagan neighbor, your Hindu neighbor on one side, the homosexual neighbor on the other side with rainbow flags, and the Muslim across the street, if, you're, if your life is not different from those around you, that are not Christian, then you're not living the holy life that is distinct, set apart life that you were called to. And to that degree, then you can't be the priest in that neighborhood, in that workplace, in that family. He saved us. He saved us and called us to a holy life. Not according to our works, but according to his own design. Okay, so works, you know, in the Pauline epistles, He's showing here, this is, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, his disciple. Timothy gets shorthand, right? Because he knows, Paul knows, Timothy knows what he's talking about. The works of the law. It wasn't, you know, Paul's a, a Jew, right? In his background, circumcised, he used to keep kosher. Timothy was raised by his Jewish mother. So he's speaking to Timothy about this. So it wasn't our Jewish background. It wasn't our works. It wasn't the law, and keeping the law, of Moses, circumcision kosher laws. You can read about this in the Judaizer heresy that was often floated around the first century uh, and when the church tried to confront it in, um, in Acts, 4, uh, Acts 15. The, uh, his, it wasn't because of our circumcision, keeping kosher, and no, 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 no. God didn't do, it was his design from the beginning, right? Long before there was circumcision kosher laws, his design from the Garden of Eden. And the grace bestowed, that gift bestowed on us in Christ Jesus, the anointed Christ, right? Old, this Old Testament 
references the works of the law, uh, but no, no, saved by Jesus the Christ, the anointed king, before time began. This is part of God's plan from the beginning. Look what he's been doing, his plan from the Garden of Eden. But now made manifest, but now made manifest through the appearance of our Savior, the one who saves us from not only our sin, but our death, right? The Savior in the Old Testament, this is the title for the king in the Old Testament. They saved you from your enemies roundabout. You can go read about this in, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul's job. You will say, you will rule over people and save them from their enemies roundabout. And he says, he says, Christ Jesus, that's the anointed king. That's his job. He's going to save us from our enemies roundabout. Well, what is our enemy? What's our enemy? A lot of times we would think our enemy is sin. That's true. Our enemy is sin. What is sin? Again, it's not breaking a rule. But it's breaking a relationship. God makes rules to help us, help us stay out of situations, to not do things that will cause a break in our relationship with him. Parents give rules to their children so that they will not hurt their relationship with them. They will not hurt their, their life. When they break the rule, the problem is the action that the rule was preventing them from trying to break, right? So, this, so God, God wants us to avoid sin because sin is actions which we turn away from him. They're contrary to his way. When we walk contrary to him, we, we separate ourselves from him. And without him, we cannot have life. So Jesus has come to conquer our enemies, save us from our enemies roundabout. Right? He shall be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. We hear that in Matthew chapter 1. Well, why is sin this great enemy? Sin brings death. When we separate ourselves from God, we don't find life. He is life. We find death instead. And so there's, there's a very important relationship that we have to understand between the action we call sin and the fruit of sin that is death. And often today we don't, we don't think about that because we're, most Christians are dualists, right? For us, death is actually uh, the end. That's the, that's the end of this world. And then we, we fly off into the clouds in our spirit form to go be with God for all eternity in fluffy clouds and play the harp with angels and whatever people have in their minds. Well, if we do die before Christ returns, yes, we do go to be with the Lord, as St. Paul says. But that's a temporary state. We are disembodied at that point. We, our salvation is not complete. What Jesus did when he saved us is not done until we have been raised from the dead. And this is why he says, look at the last line there, who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Okay, so this is what the catechumen needs to hear. This is the good news that we need to be preaching. Right? The good news is that Jesus has conquered death. He has risen from the dead, and we can be too. Well, how are we going to be raised from the dead? Paul says very clearly, and Paul's assuming of Timothy, knowledge of Paul, Pauline teaching, right? In chapter 6 of the book of Romans, the epistle of Romans, he says, all of you have been baptized in Christ, have died with him and buried with him and raised with him in newness of life. We have been buried with him in a death like his so that we might rise with him in a resurrection like his. Jesus came to conquer sin and death. These aren't two independent. So he came to conquer sin, to give us the spirit so that we could have the power to repent, that is, re be restored spiritually to God, so that we could be restored physically to God at the end of time. As Adam died that day in the garden, when he failed to trust God, failed to trust his word, that spiritual death we can see in the garden when he goes to hide himself from God, he's afraid he's naked, right? The relationship has been broken between Adam and God, and then also between man and fellow man, right? And man and woman, they're Eve, Adam and Eve are hiding each other, hiding from each other. So their relationship has been broken, a lack of trust in God's word. And that spiritual death that took place eventually 
resulted in a physical death when Adam died. And so we who are descended from Adam, who have received his nature, we all have received a yoke, a, 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 a nature is yoked to sin and death. But as St. Paul says in his seventh chapter of the Epistle Romans, who will save me from this body of death? Jesus Christ will, right? He says, we are, we are already who have been baptized to Christ. We are sons of God walking according to the spirit, crying, Abba, Father. Well, we wait, well, we wait when yearning, this is in chapter eight of Romans, along with all the creation, we wait in yearning for the full restoration when he will come again, right? When our bodies will even be adopted as sons. That is when our bodies will also be raised from the dead. And that is the purpose of the coming baptism, laying on of hands and reception of Holy Eucharist for the catechumen. The catechumen in 40 days will be baptized, will have receive the laying on of hands and receive the Holy Eucharist. In baptism, the catechumen will be brought forth, not from the waters of the old creation like Adam was, but now from the waters of the Jordan, of the new creation. The catechumen will then receive the breath of life, breathe into his nostrils, just like Adam did that moment through the laying on of hands in chrismation or confirmation, the gift of the Spirit. And then the catechumen, a new creation, will be welcomed into the garden, just like Adam was that moment, shown the trees of the garden and say, here's the tree of life. And the catechumen then eats the fruit of the tree of life, drinks its juice, of which Jesus says, he eats my flesh and drinks my blood, has life in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's the point of our baptism, so that we could receive confirmation. That's the point of confirmation, so that we could receive Holy Communion, the Holy Eucharist. And we receive the Holy Eucharist, so as Jesus says, we could be raised in the flesh. This is why it's so important to understand that the real presence of the Eucharist. Because without it, we will not be raised in the flesh at the end of time to a resurrection life. That is critical for the catechumen, critical for us. As we go through these 40 days of the great fast of Lent and this time of purification to remember the story of Abraham, the story of Israel, the story of Jesus, the story of the catechumens, the early church, the catechumens today, and our own story today. We need to look through this lens of salvation history so that we can know what God's doing in our life these 40 days and what he will do at the end of them. Glory be to Jesus Christ with his eternal Father, his all holy good and life-giving spirit, both now and ever and into age of ages. Amen.